I wanted to talk to you guys today about something particularly important. Um, it's the difference between relationship and religion. Uh, it's the difference between having a relationship with the God in heaven or being particularly religious in what you do. And I would argue that one of them is truly righteous and the other is not. One leads to life eternal and one does not. And so, I think it's really important for us to distinguish what it means when, it say, when I say to be in a relationship versus being religious. Listen to what Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 6. If you have your Bibles, open up and turn with me. Chapter 7, verse 6 of the book of Romans. Sorry. We don't have it on the screen today. We're still working out some technical difficulties on our new projector. And so it will be up there next Sunday. Um, chapter 7, verse 6 of Romans. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which has held us captive, so that we serve in a new way of the Spirit and not in the way of the written code. A new way that is of the Spirit and not a way of the written code. So here's the question that we have to answer, right? There's some important questions that this brings up. Where is it that we find our hope? Is our hope found in the idea of I need to pull myself up by my bootstraps and get the job done? Is that where your hope is found? That is where the world tells you the hope is found. And there's nothing wrong with being a go-getter, but that cannot be where you find your hope. Is it in, I need to do a good job so that God won't be mad at me? Is that, in our, is that our hope? No. Emphatically no. That is not our hope. It is not found in what we do. Is it found in, I need people to see me doing good things so that I can feel validated. Is that our hope as Christians? No. No, it's not our hope. So where is our hope found? Our hope is found in one place. In one place only. It's through the work of Christ on the cross. That is the only place that you can find true hope. If without Christ, you are hopeless. You are, even though you may spend your whole life doing good works, you may spend your whole life trying to be a good person, being kind to people. You may spend your whole life being loving. But if your hope is not found in Christ alone, you are damned to hell. It is so amazing that God gave me a sermon like this on a day that we had four baptisms. Do you know why we baptize people? It's because God did a great work in their heart and they want to publicly announce what has happened inside of them. To publicly display the great grace, the amazing grace of God that has come to live within them. They are possessed by the Holy Spirit and they will be with us forever. Praise God. That is why you have to have your hope in Christ because you can't say that about somebody who finds their hope in anything else. It's God who validates you. It's God who validates you. It's not that you need to be validated by others or that you need to tell everybody how hard you've been working or show everybody all the things that you've got going on or act like you are particularly busy for Jesus. It's not that. 
It's that God, because of who he is, validates you. It's because of who he has made you, a son and a daughter of the Most High, that you are validated in Christ. So our hope is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Where is our salvation found? You know, I listen all the time to people talk. It's one of the things that I really enjoy doing. I'm kind of a people watcher. And, and I listen to their conversations. And, and I find that the world tells us one thing. And that Christ tells us something completely different. And it's really, really essential that you get this right. Okay? There are good works. And there are Christ's works. I told you guys a long time ago, if you remember, that I have two lists in my life. Junk that I've done and great things that Christ has done. If Christ is in it, it will not fail. If Christ is in it, it will succeed. If Christ is in it, it will be great. It will be glorious. It will be holy. If Christ is not in it and it's something that you're pursuing, it may do okay. But it will never, ever be like something that God is behind. And most of the time, in my experience, it's been an utter catastrophe. Our salvation is found in a viable relationship with the living, holy God. A viable relationship. That means that you know Him and He knows you. He knows you. He seeks you. He pursues you. You seek Him. You pursue Him. I, I often think of, of mine and Sarah's relationship, and if I didn't constantly work at our relationship, if I never spoke to her, if, if I never thought about her, if I never did anything for her, how long do you think my marriage would last? Eight minutes, probably, right? Yeah, it wouldn't be a good relationship. The same thing goes with friends. You never call them. You never check on them. You never see if they're okay. How long is that friendship going to last? Not too long. It's something that you've got to invest in, and they've got to invest in. Christ has invested everything into you. Can you not do the same for Him? Christ has invested his own life for you, into you. How much have you invested in him? How many of your relationship with Christ is a constant seeking and growing? Or is it something that you do on the side when you think about it, or right before you go to bed, or right before you eat, if you can remember to do it, right? Some of us have relegated Christ and his salvation to when it's convenient for me. And here's the truth. Christ is not convenient. He's also not a tame kitty cat that you can put in a corner. He is a lion. The lion of Judah. That's the reason that he is spoken of that way in the scripture. Uh, it's really interesting in the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis talks about Aslan and... Aslan is, is a lion that is a really excellent representation of Jesus Christ in this fictional book that C.S. Lewis has written. And what's interesting is the phrase, he is not a tame lion, comes out in that book. Christ is not a tame lion. He does what he pleases. He's not your servant. He's not my servant. I don't have a special in with him because I'm a preacher. He is God. He is sovereign. And he loves you enough to sacrifice and invest everything he has in you and me. Because that's who he is. God has done a great work of grace in my life. And... He did it while I was still living in sin. 
He did a great work in my life while I was still living in sin. You see, before I knew God, I hated Him. Before I truly knew who God was, I hated Him. I hated the idea of a God that was sovereign and could do what He wanted. I hated the idea that I wasn't in charge. I hated Him. And something happened in me. Something awoke inside me, and I was never, ever the same. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And he caused me to want him so bad that I chose him. He woke me up inside and caused me to want him. And I accepted that calling in my life. He's doing the same thing to you. He's doing the same thing to everyone. You see, Christ died for all. His work on the cross is sufficient for everyone. You need to assume that the people that you were talking to are indeed future residents of heaven. And the truth of the matter is, you need to show them how residents of heaven get along. We have been brought into the family of God because of His grace. Our salvation is found in Christ alone. Our hope is found in Christ alone. And our eternity is with one another and with Christ. You see, here's a secret that some of you may not have thought of. I'm never going away. You can fire me, you can set me on fire, you can try to hit me with cars, but I'm going to live forever. If you know Christ, the same is true about you. And you will be with me and with Christ forever. So we need to begin to think about ourselves in that eternal idea, in that eternal framework. Because... Guys, eternity's a long time. If we can get together here, think about how much better we're going to know each other and love each other and all of that as eternity progresses. Don't be mad at one another. Don't get even with one another. Your hope and your salvation is greater than that. We've been in church for three years. We're celebrating the fact that God has risen us up, brought us together, and called us to a specific purpose to reach people that are unreachable. That's what our goal is. That's what our mission is. That's why we're a church. That's why we're here. The best way to do that is to know that your hope is truly found in Jesus Christ. That your salvation is found in Jesus Christ. And that this church is founded on Jesus Christ. That's why we tell you, invite people. Not so that our numbers will grow. So that they'll come learn the truth. So that they'll grow with us together. Growing numbers will be just a secondary thing that happens because God begins to work in your lives and in my life. That won't be a problem we have to solve. We don't have to have a meeting about it. What we need to do is actively seek those around us, invite them to come learn and grow and be a part of this body. And guys, we will grow. I feel the Spirit of God moving. We just had four baptisms. Four baptisms. I was at a church for eight years Eight years, and I saw zero baptisms. Zero. Let that sink in. God is moving in this church. He's moving in your lives. And He wants you to preach his salvation to all that are around. We begin here in our community, right? 
And then we go to our state, and then we go to our country, and then we go to the entire world. That is the plan that God has set out in the book of Acts. That is how the church is supposed to view how we reach out. One of the things I like most about this church is that it's loving. The second thing that I like most about this church is that it's missionally minded. That it's focused on being the church to the world and not worried about how we're going to keep it warm or keep the lights on. That stuff works itself out. I mean, if we're thinking about one another, that stuff's just going to work itself out. Praise be to God. Are you particularly religious? Do you count the number of bay leaves that come off your plant and give one to God? Or two to God? Do you count the number of sheep that you have and give one to God? Or two to God? Are you very much rigid or are you ba based in this idea of love? See, here's the thing. I can't remember a whole lot of laws. My brain just doesn't work that way. But I can remember two of them. Love God and love your neighbor. And the thing is that God in Christ distilled all the laws down into those two laws. And the idea of all those laws is held firmly in those two laws. They are not, hear me, they are not separated. They're the fulfillment and the continuation of the laws in the Old Testament. We're not separated from the Old Testament. We're not removed from Moses and the patriarchs. But we have the Messiah. We have the ability to be possessed by God, the Holy Spirit. That was not offered to those in the Old Testament. So they needed a bigger guardrail. You have God in you. You don't need a great guardrail because you have God in you. You see, when the, when, the, when the temple was made, it had a room that was a perfect square and it was called the Holy of Holies. You could go in there one time a year, one time a year, and that was the only time the priest would go in there, they'd tie a rope around him because if he wasn't holy enough, God would kill him. Then they could just drag him back out. When Jesus died on the cross, do you know what happened to the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies and the rest of the world? It was ripped from top to bottom. That means that God tore it. Removing that separation. Removing that distance so that He could be in us and for us and work through us. That's the hope. That's the salvation. That's the relationship. Jesus opened up our opportunity to have an actual relationship with the one true God. He drew us in and loved us enough to sacrifice himself so that that could be made true in our lives. And he's not separated from us anymore. And he distilled all those Old Testament teachings into these two ideas. Love God and love your neighbor. Think about that. Those are relational, are they not? Love God. How do you love God? The ways that we're talking about. You spend time with him. You seek after him. You long for him. You want to read what he's written you. You want him. If you're particularly religious, you're going to try to do everything that he wants you to do. And make sure that everybody sees that you're doing it. And there's no hope and there's no salvation in that. The next three weeks we're going to be talking about the relationship and religion. And, and I think it's, it's really important for you to understand that next week we're going to talk about prayer. And how prayer functions within a relationship or a religion. Uh, the, the week after that, we're going to talk about specifically where does God live. 
Is he in heaven? Is he in our hearts? Is he in the temple? Is he at the church? Is he in the chairs? Is he a part of all the thing? We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about the difference between law and covenant. And we're going to show a distinct separation between those two things and how one fulfills the other and does not get rid of it, but actually expands upon it in a different way. Following that, in February, we're going to have a series called Love, where I'm going to look at the four words for love in the scripture. And I think it will be deeply, uh, it, will, it will enrich your understanding of how deep and true the Bible truly is. So that's just a preview of what's coming up. And, and I really want you guys to think this week, is my life religious or is my life in a relationship with Christ? Are you religious or do you actually possess salvation? It's an important question to answer. Get that one wrong and you have hell to pay. Just to be real blunt. I'm so excited to see what God's going to do in this coming year. I really am. And I love the fact that I'm remembering more and more of your names and that I can see your faces when I pray now. I want to grow in my relationship with you all in the same way that I want to grow in my relationship with God. I want to become a part, a vital part of what is going on at this church, not just some talking head that comes in once a day and you know, and, and talks. I want to be a vital, active part of what's going on here. And I'm praying that God shows me where I can use my assets to best promote the kingdom. I challenge you guys, please do that yourselves. Look at the gifts and talents that you have and say, okay, how can I do that? If you want to find out more about this, um, Sarah, my wife, is starting a series in crosstalk next week right um, about spiritual gifts and and talents and and how all of those things fit together so if you want to learn more about this and how you can serve the body we have multiple opportunities for you to do so so we're starting to head in an awesome direction and God is so good to us so I think that it's important for us to praise God and to sing his praises and, and to be excited about what he's doing, even though it's freezing cold in here. If you're really excited, it's not quite as cold. I've gotten warmer as I've been preaching. Guys, I love you. And I'm growing to love you more and more. What I need from you it's for you to love one another enough to figure out where it is that you serve, where it is you fit in our body, and then start doing that. And if you don't know, start asking people, hey, what am I good at? They'll tell you. That's how you become a vital part of a body. Don't just come and sit in the chairs. Be a functional member. Participate in that salvation and that hope and in that relationship. That's my prayer for you guys this week and for all the weeks to come. Um, bow your heads with me. God, it has been quite a day so far. I am so pleased that you decided to keep me here so that I could deliver your word. Help it to sink deep into our hearts and into our minds. Help it to change what we do and where we go. Help us to focus on our relationship with you and not being particularly religious. It's important to work for you, but it's not the important thing. God, help us to keep that in mind. I ask it in the name of Christ. Amen.